Lahayam Kanawe Tilikam, Naga Mislaikamba Slush Tamda Matsaiga Chagui Kwalksan, Naga Sawash Ilihi Tilikam. I just wanted to do a little welcome uh, for today in our, our language that we use today, the Chinook Wawa. Um, and um, just welcomed you and just said I was glad that you're all here today and that I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Rang. And my families are I'm, uh, related to Oregon City John, who was one of the treaty signers for the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855. And um, he was um, with the um, Oregon City Tumwaters that lived there at, at the Falls area on the Westland side. And then we also had family ties and fishing areas at the Cascade Rapids of where Bonneville Dam now is. And actually, his uh, uh, father, grandfather, was actually painted by one of the early um, painters that came, uh, Tom McQuinn. He's usually, when you, they talk about the Columbia River, there's usually a picture of Tom McQuinn in there. So descended from, from him. And we had those fishing sites there at Cascade Rapids. And then also, on the other side of family, I'm also tied to the Clackamas Chinook um, and from Chief Wachino, who was also a treaty signer of the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855. And um, his family, um, uh, he signed the treaty on behalf of the Clackamas Chinook people. Um, and was, well, he was born at up on Eagle Creek on the upper part of the Clackamas River. And then they came down to on the mouth uh, for fishing and stuff a lot. But um, today, I guess, uh, first I want to, yeah, if we haven't met, I want to introduce our other two artists that have been part of this whole program. Um, Sarah Seastrom, who's Kuz, Laura Amkwa Sayusla, who's done a lot of the basketry uh, exhibit part here and then Greg A. Robinson of the Chinook Nation. And most of this on this side is his. And um, I've worked with Greg for almost, I think, 10 years now. We do a series of classes called Lifeways. Um, and we actually treat, teach the carving and the basketry um, to other tribal members and the community. And then we have a special guest here. I got Charles here, Latch, from the Chehalis tribe. And he's one of our students and real interested in working with us in the carving and stuff, and it's always great to have, um, see our new people come and, come and join us and help restore um, our art forms. But I'm gonna start today, you're very fortunate because today, this time of the year is storytelling time. And so we only tell stories during a certain time of the year and it really ties to the, to the art um, here. So we call the old stories econom. And some people say miss, I don't say miss, I call them the ancient stories. They tell how, how the world came to be and how things got to be here. And one of the first pieces here is uh, this paddle here. It's got it's the Chinookan style paddle and coyote there on top, Italopus. And in the old, old stories, Italopus is in a lot of them. Um, there were different ages of coyotes, too. There was Tonkia, who went around and kind of deemed the importance of the different traditional foods like the camas and the wapato, the berries, um, the fish, salmon, steelhead, the lamprey. Um, there was Tanakia, who was another one uh, that went both along the, the Columbia River, Willamette. Um, and then another one, Sasas Lahom, say that closely, hopefully. But uh, they were three, three different ages of the coyotes at that period of time. And then the paddle just kind of is a representative of the people and the stories that are tied, the, the econom um, stories. But um, on this piece here, this one ties to Willamette Falls, our Tumwater, which we call it. And um, we have stories of how the falls came to be. And it's interesting because um, um, Chinookan also, and then also Saniam, Kalapuya, and Shasta too. Um, so in the, in the Clackamas, we have a story of how um, the falls were created for the benefit of the people, and Coyote created the falls there at Oregon City. 
because he wanted a place where the people could easily catch the salmon, the fish. And he built a magical fish trap there. And um, he put it in the water there at the base of the falls and um, started to do something else. And the, the trap called out, I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. So Coyote went back and emptied it, put it back in. And before he could get far, he'd say it again, I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. So he took it out, emptied it, went back and put it back in. And before long again, it said, I'm full, I'm full, I'm full. Which then Coyote got kind of upset at the fish trap, which insulted the fish trap. And they say, that's why we have to dip Ned and gaff for the salmon uh, nowadays. <laughs> Because Coyote got mad at the fish trap. <laughs> but we also have a story in Saniam, Kalapuya, of why the falls are there at Oregon City in Chinook country instead of way up river in Saniam, Kalapuya country. And if you're not familiar with the Kalapuya tribes, they were pretty much all throughout the Willamette Valley. Um, we have the Tualatin, the Saniam, Salem area, Chanchifan and the Eugene area, Young Kalas, and um, down uh, south further than southern, south of Eugene area. But the Saniam, and they have a story of Italopus or Coyote, too, um, I seen um, going along the river, and it was with Meadowlark, and um, Coyote spoke Chinook, and Meadowlark spoke the Kalapuya language, and they were going along looking for a place for the falls to be. And Coyote would say, how about here? And so, um, being that they spoke two different languages, they couldn't quite understand each other, so the, the falls just kept moving along you know, slowly, <laughs> didn't stop. So they'd go further, and Coyote would um, say, how about here? And again, Meadowlark didn't understand, so the falls would sometimes kind of slow down a little bit, but keep on moving. And they kind of kept doing that, and Coyote, yeah said, how about here? And Meadowlark still didn't understand. And then uh, they got closer and closer down, down river towards Oregon City. And Coyote go, how about here? And Meadowlark still didn't understand. And then finally, they got to about the Oregon City area there. And finally, Coyote decided he'd speak Chinookwawa and said, how about here in Chinookwawa? And Meadowlark understood. So that's where they tied down the falls there. <laughs> And they used the hazel, um, twisted hazel, to tie down the falls there. So that's what the Saniam like to say and when they you know, ask about the falls and why it's in Chinook country versus upriver up in Saniam, <laughs> Kalapuya country. But this, this piece here is really a reflection of our, my family ties to the falls um, there. And there's some, it's created out of yellow cedar. Um, I work in both red and yellow cedar, and um, yellow just kind of spoils you. It's so nice to work, but both of them are really great. Um, but just to represent the, the annual fish runs, and there used to be stories of where they'd say that not very many salmon went above the falls, but when you see a flood, you can see how, how, how little difference there is in the high water when you get a good flood. So there was plenty of fish that went, went up river above the falls. Um, and then just kind of the, the El Chinook and elements in there, and then there's some kind of the petroglyph designs are not exact. We don't, it's kind of taboo sometimes to kind of copy things exactly, so I kind of change them. Um, but it kind of pretty much represents and ties to Willamette Falls and my family, family ties to there. Another one that, uh, story that we have is um, we have a lot of stories about sun, and um, this one relates to there was a, um, a Basque ogress, and um, you had to be careful because if you didn't take care of your children and you weren't watching or something, she could steal your children. Um, and she had a backpack basket that she had that she wore, and she'd steal them and put them in that basket. And so we have one story of where this woman, she was uh, married to the headman of the village. It was a big, big village. And she um, decided she wanted to go. They were having a winter, winter gathering there, winter dance. 
and she decided she wanted to go there where her um, husband was. They were kind of split up, and she was living in one house and him in another one. But she decided she wanted to go there, and so she went to that dance and um, left her child at home. Um, and she had some people there staying with her and at the house, and the baby got hungry. And there was a child, and the baby got hungry. And so one of them went over to try to tell her that it was time to feed the baby and take care of the baby. But as she went into the, the place, the plank house, where the winter gathering was, she, they just kind of pushed her to the side, to the back, and she got stuck there. So then there was another one that went to the plank house, and they got stuck there too. And there was actually five of them that went there and went to the plank house and got stuck. And during that time, the baby was alone, so the baby got stolen and found by the basket ogress who stole the child. So the basket ogress went and raised that child, and as the child grew older, she insisted that the child still be carried in the basket. So if they went anywhere, then she'd put him in the basket, and he'd have to be in the basket. Um, and the neighbors was Crane, and Crane, um, as the boy got older, um, he started going visiting Crane, and Crane told him the real story about the basket ogress that had stolen him from his mother. And um, the basket ogress, for their food, they liked to eat mashed snakes and mashed frogs and mashed bullfrogs. So Crane taught him, you know, we, the things that we eat are like the trout and the salmon and things like that. So the boy decided he wanted to, to return home to his real family. And so they decided um, how they would slay the basket ogress. And um, when they went along, the basket ogress would put him in the, in the basket, and they'd go along, and there'd be a tree, and he'd catch on to that tree and kind of hold there. And then the basket ogress's neck would stretch really, really, really long, got really, really thin. And so he decided then at the one point that he'd do that, he'd hold on to the tree and that neck would stretch really long and thin. And then he took a piece of obsidian knife and, and cut her. And the trees were his, her relatives. So he had to really work fast because the trees fell as she died. So he was hopping on these trees and then he shot arrows to the sky and he went up into the sky world. And there he met, um, the son, and he married her, and they came to earth, and they had two children, the two children you see there. And the children were twins, and they were born together. Um, and they were slowly coming apart, but then Blue Jay saw that and decided he would cut them. And so Blue Jay cut them before it was time for them to come apart, and the children died. and. Um, in mourning, then son decided that she would return to the sky with her dead children. And so she returned up to the sky, and those two children here are stars that you see at certain periods of time, and they're kind of omens um, tied to when you see those stars, if you see one star or both those stars. But uh, just wanted to tell you a few stories because I think for me in creating this art, it was important for tying to place. There's not a lot of people who know the story of, of Portland here and who the original people were here. Um, so for me, that was kind of the emphasis of what I wanted to kind of focus on with the, with the art form, is to connect um, our tribe's history and presence for a very long time here to the Oregon City, Portland area. Um, we have another story, too, of what's called um, Tung. And it's about, um, there's an island right above the falls called Rock Island today. And there was this Kukum um, monster, Ihumnakwimna, that lived there on the, on the rock. And there was a head woman, and she passed away, and they put her in the trees. They used to do the burials and put the canoe, burial canoes in the trees trees there. And he decided he wanted it, to get that, that head woman um, there at her burial site. And so they put two guards there, the two fish that had sharp, kind of like maybe sturgeon, I think. 
to watch over her and protect her there. And Ihumna um, took his fire-like tongue and went towards to get that, her body. And as he came, the two cut the tip of its tongue off. So the people were there in the village, and um, then Ihumna kept saying, give me back my tongue, give me back my tongue. It was pretty relentless to do that day and night, to say, give me back my tongue, give me back my tongue, give me back my tongue. And so finally the villagers relented and gave him back his tongue, and of course then he ate all the people there in the village, <laughs> except for one woman who had been out gathering the brody or the camas at that time. And she was pregnant uh, with the, the son. And so then um, the skukum or ihumnat kumna actually came to live with her. And the, boy, and the child was born, it was a boy. Um, and he grew bigger and bigger and go, started hunting, bring back rabbits. Ihumnat kumna would eat them just really quickly, just one gulp. There'd go a rabbit, and get deer, then bring back multiple deer. And then one day he asked his mother about, um, where are all the other people? Where are all the other people of the village? And his mom told him the stories. So then he went to the mountains and got his spirit, spirit power and brought it, brought it back. And, and then um, he came back with his spirit power and was able to destroy the monster. And then he went back up into the mountains and he took feathers and bones and he brought them back to the village area. And then with those bones and those feathers, then he restored the people, all the people that had been there, he brought them back. And he had feathers, certain feathers there for the canoes also. So he brought the village back, people back, and he was there watching them as they were busy doing their stuff. And they got kind of impatient with him because they thought he was just being idle, standing there doing nothing after all the work he'd done. <laughs> and that made him really sad, so he decided he would go into the water. And so he went into the water and became one of the water beans. And then all the people of that, that time period then became water beans also, like the salmon and the trout, the seals, things like that. So we have a lot of stories that, that tie to Oregon City, and we have one of Winnick Eist and the Oregon City Wall, uh, Oregon, or West Lynn side, there's some basalt walls there. They're mostly covered now. You can hardly see them because of the, the vines and stuff, but they're there. And we have a story of Winnick Eist, who's kind of hidden, a flatfish hidden in those, those walls there. Um, so, and then, this here rattle then is kind of another representation of sun, and um, the copper is kind of tied to to wealth. Um, and we have just different stories. We have another story of where badger and coyote are playing with a real shiny ball, and uh, well, actually, it's a village, is and then coyote and badgers had five children each, and they decided to steal that ball, so they go and steal the ball. Um, and then um, they actually um, divide it up between them and eventually one of them throws that ball and it scatters all through the land. And there are stories that say that that's actually the gold that the people found later here in the Oregon country. But um, this one here is kind of to me, it has a lot because it deals with both the, pre the past and the present. There's a piece like this that actually came from the Oregon City area there. They found it when they were actually digging the locks there at the falls there. And that piece is now at the um, Oregon Territory Museum. So if you go in there, you'll see this basalt carving similar to this one. Um, it's there. But um, so for me, it kind of ties to those the, the past and the, the old things and our connection to the falls there, but it also kind of is a reflection to me of, of my family, um, our, our family, Oregon City John, and fishing there at the falls that we did from time of memorial. And I'm kind of very fortunate in my family because 
If you're not familiar with the history of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, our tribe was terminated in the 1950s, 54 and 55. They actually, um, the uh, US government passed the Western Oregon Termination Act, which terminated the federal relationship with the tribes. Um, they closed the reservation, and the lands that were part of the reservation were sold, sold off. And so I've seen the slip from my, my grandma was about, I think, $26 to $28.50 is what she got after they closed the reservation. But my great-great-grandmother um, was living during that period of time as they were closing the reservation. And what she did then is she started writing everything she could remember about the tribe's families, which tribes they were connected to. It was really interesting because she wrote about all the families connected like these were the Tumwaters, and these were the Clackamas, this is what the Tualatin Kalapuyas, and, and Shastas, and Rogues, and because they actually had different, when they first came to the reservation, had different areas where um, they, they um, each tribal community lived families. And on the reservation, there's over 26 tribes and bands that were relocated to the reservation. But she wrote everything she could remember about those families and who was related to who. And then she also wrote about our family and telling our family history, and that's how we know the connection to Tom Aquin. Um, she's got um, Oregon City John's name in there. It's really, really long, and I can't even get the linguist to, to pronounce it. Um, but it was published in, um, by Father Crockett. Um, it was called Just a Memorandum. And he talks about um, her father, who was um, Homer Hoffer and Oregon City John, and how Homer, her father, was one of the last in our tribe to have the flattened Chinook and head um, in there. But there's talking about how smart he was at math and things like that, Father Crockett kind of writes about. Um, but she wrote about that, and she wrote everything she could remember about our tribe and our family and our connection to the places like uh, Oregon City and the Cascade Rapids and things like that. So very, very fortunate. And she wrote this right at the close of the reservation in 55 and 56. And um, kind of she passed away a few years, few years after that. But what she did before she passed away is she had written all these things done, and then she gave it to different parts of the family. And so it wasn't until later um, in the 80s that um, as we start visiting with different cousins and stuff like that, we found out we each had a piece of that, that story, and we were able to put those pieces back together. Um, so <clears throat> when she closed, you know, what she wrote in there was that, that her purpose is writing this is because she always wanted the family to know, you know, their roots and where they came from. So we were just very, very fortunate in our family that, that she, she did that for us still carries on today. So that's just kind of ties, all that kind of ties into both our history, our connection to the falls. And then this box rattle here is, um, was actually one of my earlier pieces and been very fortunate. Um, as I mentioned, Greg and I teach classes and we um, actually, um, we st I started the, this class, series of classes called Lifeways about 10 years ago. And um, what I wanted to do is, um, since our tribe went through termination in the 80s, 1983, we were restored. And so since then, we've been really rebuilding our community. So we've been building the housing, having tribal members move back to the reservation. Um, Governing governance center and education center, health center, and then um, started our cultural programs and a language immersion. We do language immersion with the tribe and start with the preschool, teaching the Chinook Wawa. And the Chinook Wawa became prevalent on the reservation because when they relocated all those different tribes and bands to the reservation, they all spoke different languages. There's Chinook, Kalapuya, Athabascan, and the Shasta language. Um, Rogue River to Kelma language. They all spoke those different languages, Salish from the Tillamooks. Um, so they all knew the trade language, although what we call the Chinook Wawa. 
So that became prevalent on the reservation and um, was, was spoken uh, a lot there. So that's what we, we um, teach in our schools now is that Chinookwawa. And then um, I worked for the tribe for about 12 years and then came and moved back to Portland. And we have an office here in Portland that we opened about then. And I wanted to do the, the cultural, um, get our people connected, because we had opportunities in Grand Round to learn about the basketry and the carving and things like that. But we have a fairly sizable population up here in the Portland area. And so decided to start a series of classes that tie to the carving and the basketry and the art form and other um, pieces of our culture here in Western Oregon. And so I started that. And about that same time, the Portland Art Museum here opened the um, People of the River art exhibit, if you've been longtime members here and are familiar with that. So it was great, great kind of just perfect timing for us. We brought the classes here to see the art here from along the Columbia River. Um, and our tribe was very instrumental in supporting the Portland Art Museum. And one of the stories I like to tie, tell is that um, Elizabeth uh, Cole Butler used to be in Eugene, and that's where she had a lot of her, her items down there that's in her collection that's here now. And I was a student at the University of Oregon and was a student in, involved with the Native American Student Union, and we did an annual powwow. And we'd have to go around and ask for donations for, for help and um, putting that on every year. So I'd always used to go and ask Elizabeth about the, doing a donation to us. So I got to meet her and um, I there and visit her. And she always was very concerned about the collection and where it was going to go, where it was going to end up. I just kind of remember that all the time. Her um, husband had passed. And she just kind of mentioned, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to all this once I'm, I'm gone. So it was just incredible then years later that our, our, my tribe would step forward and be able to fund um, it being here uh, at the Portland Art Museum. So it's just kind of neat to have this, this relationship here with the Portland Art Museum. And then we got this opportunity to do the, this here contemporary um, gallery here. I'm just very grateful for Dina Dart and all the work she's done and the great staff here. We've worked with a very large number of the staff here. And it's just been a really great um, positive experience working with everybody. Um, and of course, with Sarah and Greg, too. It's been really great working with them and us giving each other a bad time. And <laughs> so with that, um, I'll just kind of open it up to questions and see if anybody has any questions. Uh -huh. Can you tell us about your hat? <laughs> my hat is made out of western red cedar. And here in my exhibit here, I did a kind of focused on the carving, but I actually do a lot of basketry, too. And so this is a hat I made. It's kind of, kind of styled after the Chinook and kind of common everyday kind of hats. And then the paddles on it, you notice it's like the other paddles here. Um, the Chinook and paddles have that unique um, groove in them. Um, some say it's for working in the shallows and things like that. And Greg, as he mentioned at his talk, kind of the things they made they were for moving quietly in the, in the water when you're hunting the seal, things like that. Other questions? Mm -hmm. So all your carvings seem to have the, um, the notching on the side. The, uh -huh. And I wondered if that's something that's a he, new, or is that more of a style of your Yeah. Yeah, if you'll notice, is, um, there's some unique characteristics to the Chinook and carving. And you'll notice on a lot of them, if you look at some of the, the old pieces, and the, the carving goes from the mouth of the Columbia River up to the Dalles and even to into some of the plateau area. And you'll see some fairly common characteristics. And the triangles are one of them, are the zigzags. You carve up the tri triangles, and it makes the zigzags. So that's one of the common elements in the art form. You'll see the ribs, mm -hmm. um, skeletal kind of form. Um, they're fairly common when you see figures or animal figures, um, things like that. Um, a lot of them, you'll see where the, the eyebrow and the nose are kind of one feature, too. It's kind of a common, common element also. 
so there's common um, some common themes that you kind of see in the art form if you look at it, and that's to try to incorporate into the to the art. Any other questions? Uh huh. You mentioned that your dad had the sheep um, head. I um, did a little research on the Calapuya. I know. What was that now? Can you? Um, you know about the Calapuya tribe? Am I saying that right? For. Um, were they the ones that flattened? Oh, the flattened head. Yeah, the Chinookans were the primary tribes that did it, um, and it was seen as a status kind of thing, so a lot of the, the Chinooks did it. But the close nearby tribes, some of the other uh, tribes did um, that were close um, to the Chinooks, like the Tualatin. They had, some of their families had the flattened head too. And then as you've got further south, you didn't see it as much, but you'd see it more along the Columbia River, or the cl tribes closely associated um, to the Chinooks. Mm -hmm. You say most of these are rattles, are they hollow inside? Yeah, and then when you shook them, there's, there's stuff in there. and wow. There's different things you'll put in them. Some, a lot of people won't say what's in them. It's just important to them. And, but you'll kind of put like beads or stones or just kind of things that are, are important to you in them. Wow. So both of them do. And one of the other things I wanted to mention is too is that when we put this exhibit together is, you know, you see a lot of pieces that hang on the wall. But these are actually things that we use. And they're used in our... Uh, we have ceremonies and gatherings and activities like this. So, you know, once they're not on display here, um, we'll probably be using them for some, some of our activities that we do with the tribe. Mm -hmm. How would they, they're so different, the two rattles. How do you use the one that's more like a box? Is it just Yeah, they're just like shaking. They're just shaken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So, where is the reservation? Is it down around the town of Grand Ronde? Is okay. How much area is it? The, the former reservation was about 60,000 acres. And the Grand Ronde I'm speaking to is between Salem and Lincoln City. A lot of people get it mixed up with Eastern Oregon, yeah. Grand Ronde River over there. But um, <coughs> it was there, if you know where Spirit Mountain Community, uh, Spirit Mountain is, casino then are just not far from there is the actual community and we have housing there with elder housing, our health center, governance. We have a plank house there, um, an education center, elder center, things like that there. But there, yeah, formerly it was about 60,000 acres and then when we got, in the early 1900s, they started doing allotments to everybody, uh, head of households in the tribe and then anything that wasn't allotted out, they declared it surplus. So we lost half the reservation at that, that point, about 26,000 acres of it was then sold off. And most of that was timberland, because most of the reservation was in timberlands besides the little area there in Grand Ronde. Um, and then when they gave the allotments, those were tax-free for a certain period of time, but afterwards they became taxable, and then a lot of those got lost. Um, and there was like all these kinds of things happening. Like there was a store owner in, in Willamina, which was the closest store. He'd let people build up credit and then they couldn't pay. Then he'd, he'd take their land, things like that, that were happening during those periods of time. Uh huh. You mentioned that the language, the language flashes when people come together, and one language is now used in the school. Is it an attempt to preserve the others? We're working on, but a lot of those languages, are, there's no speakers, no further, but we still work with them, like the, the Clackamas. Um, we work with the Chinookan languages. Um, the Clackamas Chinook is very closely related to the Wasco Chinook, and the two of them together are called Kitsch. So we have some, there's still a few speakers of the Kitsch, Kitsch, Kitsch language. But there's nobody that specifically speaks to the Wasp, uh, the Clackamas dialect of that now. And then we do uh, a lot of work on the other ones, like just um, different tribal members working with the languages and stuff. There's um, some work that we're doing on the Kalapuya, and then also um, 
there's been work by some of the other tribes that are related, like at Siletz and Coos down that way that work on the Athapaskan languages. So. Where do you source your yellow cedar from? The yellow cedar, that's pretty much through Greg and his relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be nice to him once in a while. <laughs> Just look really sad. Gee, look at all that cedar you got. He likes to post pictures on Facebook of all those nice stashes. Every time he gets a nice new stash of cedar, he kind of puts it on there to tease everybody. <laughs> so. But yeah, we've been fortunate because he's got a, a relative that actually um, can get a hold of some. some so, uh huh. Where do you learn the weaving? The weaving, um, we started um, working with some of our elders in Grand Ronde, and then we've done a lot of kind of sharing. Um, one of our elders there, Connie Graves, was the one I actually started um, learning from, and she still teaches today. She does, yeah, classes there in Grand Ronde. Um, and then people like uh, Margaret Matheson, who's, she's not native, but she's really worked with the Western Oregon, Northern California styles of weaving. Um, and worked a lot to help get it, um, bring back this, those old soils specific to our areas. And then just a lot of sharing and stuff. Um, people go out and learn from other people and bring it back and share it. And so that's how, kind of how we do it today. Mm -hmm. Are there other artists in your family? Other artists in my family? Yeah, there is, actually. But a lot of them don't admit it. <laughs> They don't, because a lot of even our students will come in and they'll say, I don't know how to draw a straight line. And it's just amazing once they um, start working with it and doing a lot of things, how amazing. And just one that came to mind, my, my sister says, I'm, I can't draw. And she does some pretty cool stuff and, and that she does. And, um, but we have a lot of, of, of people now that are into it. And one of the things I think is, um, here in the Portland community with our classes that we provide. We have a good program in Grand Round, and we have carving um, in the basketry. And we're actually um, getting some other tribal members, too, that are um, becoming real great at the carving and stuff like that. And we have a lot of stuff going on at Grand Round where they're carving. Um, pretty much we have a full-time, at least one full-time carver now, and he's working on stuff there for the tribal offices and things like that. Um, we just created the new powwow grounds, and this, this year we'll be, I think, working on some pieces for that. Um, we have a cultural center that we've been slowly building, and it's got the first phase in. So if you're in Grand Round, we do have a cultural center there, and we're working towards the next, next stages of that, um, which will incorporate a lot of the carving, and, the, and then, of course, within the museum, the basketry and things like that. And is there a gallery? There's, there's a little gallery. Or? There's a little gallery in there, yeah. And um, I think this year they're going to start um, exhibiting um, artists in there, tribal artists mm -hmm. too, yeah. And they just did a show actually in um, in Newburgh this past mm -hmm. year with the Chehalem Cultural Center. Where we had a bunch of artists in there. I had a couple pieces in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Do they mm -hmm. still have a lot of the art in the? They, yeah, they have some pieces in there, and I think this year they're looking at reworking that. So I'm not sure what the plans are, but I heard they're going to rework some of that. I think it's nice because the people that come there, a lot of them are non natives. It gives you yeah. history, a sense of the place of where they're at. And, yeah. And you know, it tells about the people. Yeah. So there's a lot of like a hist historical photos there, but that area, I think this year they're planning to rework that this year. Uh -huh. um, at the Tillicum opening of the bridge, mm -hmm. the tribe had a village there, mm -hmm. and it was really hot that day, but I just thought it was very well received, and it was very well done. Were you, was the tribe pleased with the attendance? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then if you don't know, Greg was the artist, and you know, he's got two pieces there on the bridge. On each end of the bridge, there's some basalt pieces, and then on the Omsi side, there's a, a bronze piece also. And then they had a blanket uh, commission for that. So his work is on a Pendleton blanket design there too. 
So the tribe does have those for sale, yeah, too. So, see, I did put in a pitch for you. <laughs> I don't know if they do yet. It's a good idea, though. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Mm-hmm. One last question. Is, um, you refer to coyote. There are lots of stories about coyote. Are they linked at all to the stories of coyote in other parts of the western, other western states? I think as you, if you kind of hear some of the stories, you'll see a lot of coyote kind of common elements. Like there's, we have a story of, um, of, of salmon, and the Clackamas have a variation, Lower Chinook has a variation, Kathlamet has a variation, but they're all kind of similar, but there's usually variations tied to, a lot to location. Um, so those, those kinds of things you'll see. There's a lot of um, tribes, I think, throughout the Americas that have the arrow kind of story like I told today, but there's a lot of those that have those where they shoot those arrows to the sky to enter the sky world, things like that. So there's a lot of common kind of little themes and stuff with a lot of variation within them total. Mm-hmm. Are these stories written anywhere, or are they completely oral? Um, well, we got fortunate in the Clackamas, and they were recorded by linguists. Um, before we lost the Clackamas language. They're actually recorded in the Clackamas language and then translated into the English. And there's those for mm-hmm. um, a lot of our tribes at Grand Round where there were some linguists in the area that did a lot of recording of those and then recorded them in original languages and then um, into the English. And are they published somewhere? Or? There's some published texts, like there's a Clackamas Chinook text, there's Kalapuya texts, um, and most of them were published like in early ethnology series, linguistic journals and things like that. Um, one that kind of does an abbreviation and actually changes some of the stories is that Coyote was going there by Gerald Ramsey. That one's fairly common, well known, but he does variations to the stories and stuff like that. So. Do the stories sort of morph over time? Are they alive? Do they, or are they once they're written down, do they stay the same? No, <laughs> one of them I didn't mention today, but we have stories about the water beans um, that live in the water in the, in the Willamette and the, and the Columbia Weymouth, the, the Columbia River, and um, well, there's old old stories about those water beans. There's also more, they call them historical, during the historical period, during that period after contact there, where there's still stories that are connected um, to those, those water beans. And one of them is about this one that lives in the water. And um, um, they say that the, the, the ferries went along, they'd get stuck in these currents. And it was those water beans that were holding them, holding them there. Um, so there's still that, that connection to more contemporary times also with those stories. So the storytelling time is in the winter, or what, and then there are there other times of year? Yeah. And, and then why? Yeah, the storytelling time is usually in the winter time, and there is just taboos, like if you tell stories out of, out of time where they say you might get um, um, stung by a bee or... <laughs> or bitten by a snake, things like that. So if we try not to test them too much. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, does Canoe Journey continue to have an impact on the arts? Yes. I think the Canoe Journey has been the, I've lost count how many years the tribe's been involved. But uh, if you're not familiar, there's an annual um, journey of where Tribes throughout the Northwest Coast, Oregon, Washington from California, British Columbia, Alaska. Um, and then we have guests that come over from Maori and Hawaii and things like that, join some of the local canoe groups. But then like our, ours, we have a canoe called Shatankia, which is named after the an- ancient coyote I mentioned. Um, so we will paddle down the Willamette, go on the Columbia, um, we'll join up with the, the Lower Chinook um, down in their area. 
and then we'll go up um, into the Puget Sound or along the ocean. And there's, um, so all those canoes get together usually. We didn't have one in 2015, but the next one's 2016 in the Squally. And so there's usually about, just around about a little over 100 canoes that get together. And then they have a week of what they call protocol, and that's the dancing and singing. All the tribes get up, um, starting with the furthest away, and they, they share their songs and dance and gifts and things like that. And so they go through all those visiting tribes there into the end where the host tribe then is there singing and dancing and gift giving. So those pretty much happen annually and um, have become very, very popular with the tribes and has helped a lot. We use it for youth prevention. Um, so we're always working throughout the year on gifts and stuff for those events and things like that. Are those open to the public? There's, that is generally open to the public, yeah. So, yeah, it's a big gathering. Uh-huh. Um, a lot of stories were created in, in terms of in relation to certain events long ago or in response to, you know, certain things that happened that in a lot of ways can't be explained. So I'm curious about sort of your idea or opinion of story making or story creating today. What kind of stories are tribes or Grand Ronde or any other tribe, what kind of stories are being made today? Are they all related to exact history or, or is there still some uh, sort of a creation of um, some other kind of component to it, sort of an unexplained component. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? I think kind of, I just can kind of draw, because, you know, like we have stories like you're saying that are really kind of old and people kind of connect them to things. Like we have a flood story that's told in the Mary's River, Kalapuya, mm -hmm. before the people went on um, up to Mary's Peak there to f get away from the flooding waters. Um, for today, um, it's just really hard because I think of this like um, we were talking earlier about the historical, you know, how there's that connection to those old stories and things like that, but they, and they, but they tie them to kind of more contemporary kind of, kind of things. So I still think that's connection there, but I, it's really hard to kind of guess or say, you know, what that is going to look like, you know, you know, probably maybe a period down the road we'll be able to look back and say, yes, this is, this is the connection, those kinds of things, but I can't write off or think of anything. Other question? Mm -hmm. What materials do you use for paint and your other, and your carbon? Oh, okay, tools? Are they good. Or yeah, I forgot. Um, there's a mixture here, and this blue in here, and this red, red here, some of these are the natural pigments, and we still will gather them. Um, this one actually came uh, from this area, uh, a blue that we have, um, that we can get the, they're like clayish, or they're, when, or like a rock when they're dry and hard, and then we'll kind of ma mash them up. In the old days, they would take those pigments and mix them with um, um, salmon eggs. Um, as the binder. Um, but mine are a mixture of pigments and then also modern things like the acrylics and stuff like that. So, but we do go out and we gather the actual the natural minerals. We have a cool blue one that we get where it's like a pine cone going through petrification. Um, and it's cool because when you first find it, if you just, like sometimes it's in a bank and stuff and you find it, and when you first see it or you break open one of those, it's a pure white clay. It's real beautiful and you want that white clay, but as soon as the air hits it, it starts turning to blue. It becomes a really dark, dark blue. It's pretty cool. And that would be a, kind of a real high value trade, trade item yeah, for us. So we still use those today, yep. Well, thank you, Greg, very much. Okay, yeah. hi, Masi. Hi, Masi.